Thanks a lot. Good morning, everybody. Thanks a lot, Martin, for this very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure for me being here today. Thanks also to Philip for inviting me to present our research on histomonosis and the molecular repertoire of Histomonas melarcatis. As most of you might not be aware of the disease, etc., and the pathogen itself, I will take you through a quick ride of the research periods, how I call them, and you will see why I call them research periods. It all started in 1893, and this is the original description by Samuel Cushman of the disease. He described the difficulties you had in Turkey racing because turkeys were roaming over other lands. But he also described the greatest obstacle, however, seems to be a disease that's carried off the young turkeys at certain age. And that's the original description of black hat disease. Later on in 1900, it was described in chickens as well by Chester. And in Ed, Ed Tisso in 1920, he reclassified the pathogen as a flagellated histomonas melarcatis, a real landmark, the work of Ed Tisso in coccidiosis research and also in histomonas research. Soon later, it was discovered that one of the most important ways to transmit the, the parasite is via the intermediate vector, at that time Heterarchis papillosa, nowadays Heterarchis gallinarum. And then the time period started to develop drugs because turkey production in the US went down dramatically due to blackhead disease, how it's called as well. And the first drugs developed were arsenical drugs, but then Waletsky made, made a science paper and he published the efficacy of imidazoles, furasolidone, and then paramomycin, an aminoglycosid antibiotic, in 1962 by, by Lindquist already published, being effective as a prophylactic tract, not as a treatment. Immunological studies were carried out, but the main conclusion was that you cannot prevent blackhead by vaccination at that time. And genetic relationship between different uh, chicken lines were investigated. And after 1976, and it is nearly unbelievable, there is no real scientific publication on histomonas, histomonosis or blackhead research. Until 2003. And in 2003 I put up a paper of uh, Larry McDougall's group, they showed that a transmission can also occur in an experimental setting between birds absent in the absence of the intermediate vector heterarchis and heterarchis X. So the situation which we face nowadays in the US and in the European Union is not resistance comparing to the talk in the morning and all, a lot of other talks. The, the problem we face is we have no drugs available anymore. And the US, with the withdrawal of Histostat, late in 2015, we have also no drugs anymore. This is the situation on farms in Austria, for example. Very complicated picture. Different mortalities, different intervention period, uh, measurements like Paro4. This is an off-label use of paramomycin, which people use. This is a farm where we had blackhead several times on the same farm. And for this farm, it became reality. The farmer has stopped uh, turkey production uh, due to the severe outbreaks. There are no real figures on the importance of the disease in Turkey. Uh, we know that in France, it is of uh, major importance in Turkey production, also for Turkey breeders. Substantial outbreaks, some latest figures are from the US in 2018 from Stephen Clark, we have 127 outbra 27 outbreaks in Turkey. In Germany, for example, last year we had 1 million birds involved in outbreaks, of which 150,000 died or had to be killed. Had to be killed based on the statement of Samuel Cushman in 1893. This is again uh, one phrase of his uh, publication, and therefore he says, therefore stamp out the disease when it first appears. And that's something we do nowadays. 130 years later, again. How could it look like? This is a turkey barn. The turkey toms are 53 days old. This is the day here. And then you can see the increasing mortality. You can have 800, 900 dead birds a day. And at the end of the day, you have 90% mortality. But the mortality can also go like this. It goes up to 20% and then it goes down again. 
And these two situations more or less reflect an earlier study published from France, where you see on the x-axis the mortality, on the y-axis the frequency, and you can see the major losses are in, in, in farms with mortalities below 10%. So the scenario which you saw up here is probably the exception, and it's not the rule. Now, how does the lesions look like? So, if you miss everything in veterinary medicine and in poultry pathology, you will never miss blackhead. Uh, it's pretty obvious. You have the substantial liver lesions and you have the cecal lesions. But it might look like this as well. This is also blackhead, these are turkeys, and you won't find any liver lesions at all. These are the livers, and you can see the livers look pretty nice. But if you look to the Zika, then you can see the Zika are nearly erupting and full of Zika scores. And this is the case which I showed you before, where mortality went up to 20% and then it went down again. What is the situation in chickens? There's limited information in chickens. Two different groups, our group in Austria and Will Landmann's group in, in the Netherlands did serology on, on self-developed ELISAs. And whereas Will didn't find a difference between the housing systems, we found a clear difference between the housing systems. If you lose biosecurity in organic free range, in conventional to conventional deep litter, in comparison to conventional deep litter, you see a substantial increase of outbreaks. There are uh, PCR uh, papers from Germany, for example, and there is a paper from Poland showing that the type of production is PB, and that's broiler breeder, that it is an issue in broiler breeder. And indeed, it's an issue in chickens. Even so, in the literature, it might tell you that the chicken is just a reservoir, and it's not a pathogen in chickens at all. I think this statement can nowadays and today be revised. This is a picture I took about 15 years ago. This is the same bird in lay. This is the liver, and this is the seeker. And that's something we do not see nowadays anymore. What we see nowadays is something like this. You do a post-mortem, and your first diagnosis as a veterinarian is cholibacillosis. You see the perihepatitis very severely, and if you go back, if you go further in your post-mortem, you go to the Zika, then you see the Zika scores, and this is blackhead. This is not coccidiosis. And this is the same in all these cases which you see here. You see a substantial uh, sickening of the sequel war. You see the sequel scores, as for example here, you see the cholibacillosis, the cholibacillosis in all these cases. And in clinical, from a clinical perspective, you are faced with a scenario that you have to treat then the E. coli, e. coli infection, of course. And we see it in broiler and layer breeders as well. And this scenario brought us up to a picture where we thought, could it be that histomonas forces the translocation of Escherichia coli from the gut to internal organs? And what we did is, we took three, three isolates of Escherichia coli from the cecum, from the heart, and from the liver, in case of cholibacillosis in connection with histomonosis. We did PFGE analysis, and we found out of 250 isolates, 188 completely were identical between the gut and the internal organs. So we do think this is a good proof, clinical proof, that histomonas is a door opener for Escherichia coli to translocate from the gut to internal organs. If you infect chickens, SPF chickens, experimentally, and these are four-week-old birds, then you can see, you see substantial increase in sequel lesions, and you see liver lesions, but less substantial as in turkeys, of course. The chicken is less susceptible, but you might see lesions as well, but the sequel lesions are always present. But of course, you might conclude, and this is shown also supported by this immunohistochemistry, that histomonas, histomonosis is a gut disease. You see here uh, turkeys, you see the macroscopic picture from turkeys, you see the macroscopic picture from chickens, and this is the histology with immunohistology, and you see the parasites uh, 
invading the cecal tissue. This is the muscularis layer, and you can see here the muscularis, but in turkeys, it's much more substantial, of course. Just to round up the epidemiology, you have the parasite also in other bird species, mainly in galliforms. All galliform species are susceptible for the parasite and for the disease. Uh, peacocks, for example, but also guinea fowls. You can see here outbreaks which we just handle from France. Uh, these are, uh, is a picture from Larry McDougall. These are quails. And we did a substantial study also in the UK with colleagues on partridges on game birds. So, where does the problem start? The problem starts here. That's the isolation and propagation. So this is one of our first cultures and I want to introduce you to the problem which we faced and show you how we uh, 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 tried to solve this. When you do a culture from the sequel content of a diseased or even maybe a healthy animal, you see different protosome parasites which are moving. They are flagellates and you don't know if this is the same as this, as this, as this, because they can change the morphology. This is the first difficulty you have. And you can see what I have put up here from Clark and Diamond, establish all these organisms in culture is far from a routine procedure. Growing them in the lab remains an art rather than a science. So you can have a lot of inspiration and a lot of ideas how to grow them. But this statement is not on Histomonas meleacritis. This statement is on Ant amoeba histolytica, which is amoebiasis in humans. This statement is about Balantidium coli in cattle. This statement is about Diantamoeba fragilis in pigs and humans. So growing them is really a challenge. What you do need is the rice starch as a carbohydrate source. That's something they definitely need. Without carbohydrates, you cannot grow them. And you see they take up the carbohydrates. I'll show you some better pictures later on. Now, in order to solve this problem, what do we have in the culture? We came up with a very simple idea. We were remembered as veterinarians that in medicine we do in vitro fertilization on single cells. And our idea was as, you, as those flagellates replicate, grow by cell division, we take a single cell under the microscope, as you can see here, and from this single cell we grow a whole population of cells. And that means you have a clonal culture. Because the culture starts with a single cell. And that's crucial for all later experiments, which I will show you now. So we did it for Histomonas melacritis, we did it for Tetratrichomonas, and these are already clonal cultures, and you can see how they can change their morphology. And this is Plastocystis, this is a protist, uh, formerly known as a fungi, uh, quite important uh, in discussed in humans as a, as a zoonotic agent. And what we did next is we assigned those clones with the terminology of influenza viruses. So with that, this is Histomonas melacritis, Turkey, Austria. This is the diagnostic number, this is the clone 6, and this is the year 2004. So we can exactly, with every single colony, with every single clone, clone we can go back to the outbreak and to the bird. And based on this system, having such clonal cultures available, this made us, uh, brought us into fortune that we could develop various tools. For example, we developed diagnostic tools based on those clonal cultures. We developed PCRs, we developed ELISA, in-house uh, indirect sandwich ELISA, based on those cultures as well. In the next step, we raised antibodies. This is a liver uh, histology, and you can see the liver cells, and in the, here you see Histomonas melacritis. This is a bursa. We developed in situ hybridization. In the final stage, the parasite invades, disseminates in the whole organism, and you find the parasite even in the brain, in the turkey. And this is a bursa. You see the bursa follicles, and you see here, interfollicular, the 
coloring of the in situ hybridization. And we used those cultures to test substances, of course. We tested a lot of substances, uh, herbal substances, uh, phytobiotics, etc. Some of them showed an effect in vitro, but none of them showed an effect in vivo in chickens and in turkeys. And we had a PhD student from Denmark with us for some time who was interested to test artemisinin annua. Artemisinin is a very important drug in malaria therapy. So a protozoan, very important in humans, of course. And the idea was that artemisinin can be used to, to uh, cure, to prevent a blackhead. And you can see the in vitro data looks quite nice, but we went, when we did in vivo studies in chickens and in, in turkeys, we lost uh, uh, the birds and uh, it didn't show any effect. And then we went for vaccine development. This was something we had in mind from the beginning, I can say. And we did a very simple approach again. We used our clonal culture. We passaged it 295 times every three days. So you can see how long it takes. It takes about three years and then you are there, probably, or not. And then we realized that the parasite is attenuated. But it was not only attenuated, which was questioned before quite substantially in 1967 by Lund. He wrote, you can never attenuate histomonas. Uh, there might be attenuated strains around in the environment, but you're not able to, to attenuate them. But we were able to attenuate them because we start from a single cell. And we did challenge studies, different challenge studies, even in chickens, and this is a picture in laying chickens now. And this is the non-protected bird which stopped laying, and this is the bird which was vaccinated. So we did quite a lot of studies on uh, efficacy, but we also looked into safety. What happens with our vaccine, tentative vaccine? And we realized when we do immunohistochemistry that our vaccine strain hardly evades from the Zika to internal organs. It mainly resides in the cecum of turkeys. And we did a study, a very uh, laborious study, we did a reversion to virulence study, which you have to do in licensing vaccines, all kinds of live vaccines. We did five times back passages in chickens, in turkeys, and at the end of this, we took the material and put it into 30 chickens again, into 30 turkeys again, and we did a lesion scoring, the attenuated strain in turkeys and in chickens versus the virulent in turkeys and in chickens. And you can see that the attenuation is pretty substantial even after five back passages and bringing it back to 30 uh, individuals again. You have some sequel lesions in red, but you have hardly liver lesions, nearly zero, and in chickens, it's the same. And we looked into immunology. What is the immunological response on vaccination? Uh, we realized that interferon gamma, even so it's an extracellular protosome parasite, obviously that's our theory at the moment, plays a crucial role in the defense mechanism as well. And just to show you how a vaccination experiment could look like, these are the vaccinated birds, 15 days post-challenge, and these are the non-vaccinated birds three days earlier. So at 15 days post-infection, post those birds are not alive anymore. You can see the sulfurish diarrhea. Uh, the birds are severely sick. The majority of birds has died off already. And these are the vaccinated birds. So the immunity which you can induce by a tentative vaccine is a pretty strong immunity as long as you get the birds vaccinated. <clears throat> Now, leaving the field of the biology, coming a bit to the molecular biology. What do we know about the parasite and uh, its molecular repertoire? We do know that Histomonas meleacritis is uh, a member of the Tritricha monadae. His closest relative is Dia and Amoeba fragilis. Dia and Amoeba fragilis is present in pigs and is present in humans. It's in a debate 
if it's a zoonotic agent or not. It's isolated from healthy individuals, but also from individuals with diarrhea. It's very different, difficult to culture the Entamoeba fragilis as well, so it's not, a, not an easy subject at all. It's a flagellated protozoan, of course, histomonas belonging to the class, uh, Trichomonadea, as I said. Now, based on 18S RNA typing, some years ago we did a study together with colleagues in France, and we detected that we might have two different genotypes of E. coli. We find the 18S RNA uh, typing still very reliable. Uh, the majority of isolates of types which we have from Europe are all genotype 1. Uh, genotype 2 is the exception, and genotype 2 was exactly the field case which you saw before without any liver lesions. So we think uh, if you might came ac come across such a pathomorphological picture, it, is, uh, it might be genotype 2. The separation into two different genotypes was first confirmed by using alpha-actinin. Alpha-actinins actinins are very important proteins for this flagellated protozoan parasites because they need actin, actin as for the cytoskeleton and to move forward. And even if you use uh, the RNA polymerase RPB1, you can see a clear discrimination between the two genotypes. So we think this typing is very robust. How can we use this typing? Go back to a field situation again. Occasionally, at least in Austria, but also in France, we have flocks where we have males and females together in a single shed. They are just separated by this simple wire fence. And occasionally there are reports, there are reports in the literature that the males all die heavy, heavy uh, mortality due to blackhead, but the females are all healthy. And for a long time, we asked ourselves the basic question, are these females simply not infected, and that's why they are not dying, or are the females infected at all? And for that, in a recent study, we did a lot of sampling. We sampled dust samples. Dust is still a good environmental sample, uh, which we established years back to at, at least trace the, the DNA of the pathogen. And we sampled uh, Zika from deceased males, and we took cloacal swaps from males and from females. And we did this on three different farms, which faced the same scenario as you can see here. And if you see this is farm A, this is farm B, and this is farm C, then you can see by 18S RNA typing that the positive samples from farm B, the livers, the cloacal swabs, the dust samples, they all uh, group together, and they group together from farm C and from farm A. So with this, we can confirm that obviously, the females are infected, but they don't die. They even go to slaughterhouse at the end of the day. We have no real explanation for that phenomenon. What is known about the molecular data? The molecular data heavily rely on 18S RNA gene, uh, as I showed you, for phylogenetic analysis. There are only a few studies reported on other sequences. For example, one of the first ones was uh, from a group in France. They uh, uh, characterized three genes involved in hydro, uh, hydrosome establishments, hydrogenosomes. Hydrogenosomes are evolutionary wise the precursors of mitochondria. These primitive flagellates have no mitochondria to produce energy, as all our cells have. Uh, they have what is called hydrogenosomes. And then we ourselves, Ivana Bilic, uh, together with Michael Lebel, we characterized alpha actinins, and then the group of uh, Robert Baxter did some work on cDNA libraries and beta tubulin genes. But the question when you are doing proteomic study, when you are doing molecular studies, this should be a video as well. Oh, yeah, now it's moving. So this is histomonas. You can even see the flagellum of the parasite here. 
So we have a colonial culture, that principle I explained you, but we have a severe hindrance to perform detailed proteomic studies, and the big hindrance is the, all what you see in the background, and that's the wild-type bacterial flora. Because we still have the wild-type bacterial flora in the background of the eukaryotic cell. So this parasite-bacteria interaction is a very strange one. We have xenic uh, cultures, which have an undefined microbiota, and this is what you see here. We have axenic absence of bacteria. We cannot produce axenic histomonas cultures. They are not published, uh, uh, reproduced uh, anywhere in the labs. But we were aiming for monoxenic cultures, and I will show you how we achieved that. Just to give you a picture how this relationship looks like between bacteria and protozoa, this is the protozoan cell, this is the nucleus, this is the rice starch, which you see here as well, as an uh, as a important nutrient source. This is the hydrogenosomes. And what you see here inside by electron microscopy, this is the same as here, you see the bacteria. This is the size dimension you see and the correlation you see. So they phacotosotize bacteria. And this led to a controversy on etiology. For a long time, people were not convinced that the flagellate itself is causing the disease. And it's unbelievable. You have such a tremendous disease, which I showed you on video. And even in 1961, remember in 1976, research stopped, there were papers on the etiology of blackhead. In 1966, another paper on the etiology of blackhead disease. And even Malcolm Reed made a paper in 1967, wrote in a the filterable virus theory, the bacterial histomonas theory, Cox postulate, how can you fulfill them? What is causing this disease? Is it really the parasite or not? Because you isolate different protosome parasites, as I showed you before, and you have the wild-type bacterial flora. So this shows you the parasite again. Here you see the flagellum much nicer, well, most likely after cell division, and in the background you have the bacteria. And if you take off the bacteria, the protosome parasite does not grow anymore, and it will die off. But we achieved in a very substantial setting and very uh, frustrating uh, procedure at the beginning, but quite luckily at the end, to substitute the whole wild-type flora with a single bacterial isolate. And the single bacterial isolate, which you see here, is in green. This is Escherichia coli DH5-alpha, which, uh, which we made uh, genetically recombinant with, with GFP, so it's, it's, it's green fluorescence protein. And this is a cut through a single cell. This is a single cell, and you can see the histomonas cell. This is the nucleus, and this is the Escherichia coli adjacent the histomonas cell, and then you can see it's in the cell. So this is the same cell. So having this system available, this is pretty smart, because you can knock out DH5-alpha quite easily via certain antibiotics, and you can replace them with other bacterial isolates. And then you can make monoxenic cultures with Clostridium perfringens, with Enterococcus, with Salmonella, with Pseudomonas, whatsoever. And you can investigate the impact of the bacteria on the protozoa, which we are currently doing. But you need those detailed cultures as well to do proteomic studies, to study the, the proteome of your parasite. Because if you still have your wild-type bacterial flora in the background, you do not know if a single protein comes from the bacteria or does it come from the parasite. And that's why we developed this system for the virulent and for the avirulent parasite, going back to a single cell. And both of them in the background of Escherichia coli DH5-alpha, as you can see here. We did animal studies, and we could show that the difference in virulence is mainly due to the parasite. So even if you do a monoxenic virulent parasite in the background of DH5-alpha, it kills the turkeys, but with a certain delay of about one week. Whereas the avirulent 
still stays avirulent. But what we do have available, the biological system we have available is a defined system where all microorganisms in the culture are known. We have only one defined microorganism, this is DH5 alpha plus histomonas, instead of having histomonas with hundreds of bacteria. And with this setting, we started to perform investigation on the transcriptome and the exoproteome, on the proteome and the exoproteome of the parasite. So these proteins which are released in the supernatant and which can act as possible virulence factors. The strategy we did, we did first of all transcriptome analysis, the novo sequencing of transcriptomes, and we built up a transcriptome database. And then we did proteome analysis, we did it on a gel-based methods, we did 2D uh, gels, 2D Deitch gels, and we did a cell-free method to thwart MS technology, and then we did bioinformatics. And we did exoproteome analysis. We looked which kind of proteins are secreted from the avirulent, from the virulent, in comparison, and we did it again by gel-based methods and by gel-free methods, and then we used the bioinformatic analysis and compared it with the transcriptome database which we established. Because there are, there are not many transcriptome databases on that kind of flagellated protosome parasites. There is, of course, information available, for example, on Trichomonas vaginalis, the most important sexually transmitted disease in humans. And this is an outline of the transcriptome analysis. You can see we have certain contexts from the attenuated and from the virulent strain, and the proteins identified are proteins which are involved in cytoadherence, for example, but also proteins involved in destruction and in lysis of cells. So we came up with a whole transcriptome map for the parasites, and we went on to proteome analysis, proteome analysis in 2D gel analysis, separating proteins by the isoelectric point and by the size of the proteins. And we did it uh, several times. We purified the parasites, get rid of bacteria as good as possible, debrief them from serum, which they also don't like, and then we were running different gels in comparison to have the replicates. And if you looked at those gels, you might think they all look identical, but that's not true. If we go to the virulent parasite, we have the majority of proteins on a low uh, kilodaltons, between 15 and 50 kilodaltons, whereas on the attenuated one, they are more beyond 50 kilodaltons. That, that might be due to the peptidase activity, which we realize in the virulent strain in comparison to the attenuated strain, which we repeated then also by selecting spots on the 2D gel electrophoresis and go on to direct on Malditov MS analysis. And if you do this, what you find is that you have proteins involved in carbohydrate metabolism, you have peptidase active proteins, and you have PLG plasminogen binding proteins, which are quite important. Plasminogen binding proteins are important because they transfer plasminogen to plasmin, and that's a important uh, serine peptidase which is active in cells which need to migrate in the body, like, for example, cancer cells, like immune cells. And pathogens use this as well. And if we look to the attenuated strain, then we see most of the proteins are involved in metabolic processes, in cell division, but much less in peptidases. And this correlates with the morphological picture. Here you can see this is the virulate form, this is the pleomorphic attenuated form, but if you put them under stress, they look the same again. And finally, we look to the exoproteome. We characterize protein which the parasite secretes, and in parasitology, the proteins which are quite important are peptidases because, as I said before, they are needed to destruct extracellular matrices. And you can easily control the secretion and the presence of uh, peptidases, and this is done in this kind of gels. This is called cymography. You add gelatin to your gels, and at those places where the gelatin is digested, you get white spots. And you can see the comparison between the avirulent and the virulent, the whiteness, it's much more uh, uh, severe here. And if you add TLCK, which is a special 
inhibitor of cysteine and serine proteases in different concentrations, then you can see you can inhibit quite well in the avirulent form, but not in the virulent form. So we think peptidases are an important virulence factor. Just to summarize these transcriptome and exoprotein studies, we found mainly cysteine peptidases uh, in the virulent form, uh, which we think are important virulence factors. Metabolism, very important also, especially in the attenuated form, adapted to this environment. Different size categories of proteomes in proteomics uh, on exoproteome constitutions, we started to characterize these peptidases. Now I took you through a ride through this disease and to the pathogen, and I hope I could show you some of our investigations which we did since 2003. It's pretty obvious we have no therapeutic, no prophylactic drugs. This is an economical issue, but at the same time, it's a very severe animal welfare issue. If you see the turkey suffering from blackhead, this is a terrible disease for the animals. So we think defined cultures uh, I tried to explain you, they could be the way to a vaccine. It would be the first live flagellated vaccine developed in medicine ever, to be honest. And I showed you the advantage of molecular studies in a background of E. coli environment. Thanks has to go to various cooperation partners, most substantial funding from Austrian organizations like the Christian Doppler organization, like the Austrian Science Fund, who did our basic funding on the proteome studies. Uh, a lot of things has to go to the clinic, and especially to Ivana Bilic here. This is a picture from our last Christmas celebration. Uh, and if you're further interested in the subject, we have published quite a number of free uh, reviews on this. And as Martin said before, we are hosting a parasite symposium together with the Royal Veterinary College in London and those who are first interested in all kinds of parasites infestating poultry, you are cordially invited for that. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot.